The Christmas truce has become one of the most famous and mythologized events of the First World War. But what was the real story behind the truce? Why did it happen? And did the British and German soldiers really play football in no man's land? Late on Christmas Eve 1914, men of the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, had German troops in the trenches opposite them singing carols and patriotic songs and saw lanterns and small fir trees along their trenches. Messages began to be shouted between the trenches. The following day, British and German troops met in no man's land and exchanged gifts, took photographs and some played impromptu games of football. They also carried casualties and repaired trenches and dug out. After Boxing Day, meetings in no man's land dwindled out. The truce was not observed everywhere along the Western Front. Elsewhere, the fighting continued and casualties did occur on Christmas Day. Some officers were unhappy at the truce and worried that it would undermine fighting spirit. After 1914, the High Command on both sides tried to prevent any truce on a similar scale happening again. Despite this, there were some isolated incidents of soldiers holding brief truces later in the war, and not only at Christmas. In what was known as the live and let live system, in quiet sectors of the front line, brief pauses in the hostility were sometimes tactically agreed, allowing both sides to repair their trenches or gather their dead. Now we will listen to some first-hand accounts of soldiers on that day. We were in the front line. We were about 300 yards from the Germans. And we had, I think on Christmas Eve, we'd been singing carols and this, that and the other. And the Germans had been doing the same. And we'd been shouting to each other, sometimes rude remarks, more often just joking remarks. Anyway, eventually a German said, tomorrow you know shoot, we know shoot. And the morning came and we didn't shoot and they didn't shoot. So then we began to pop our heads over the side and jump down quickly in case they shot, but they didn't shoot. And then we saw a German standing up waving his arms and we didn't shoot and so on. And so it gradually grew. We heard a German singing Holy Night, of course, in German, naturally. Then after he'd finished singing, there were all sorts of Christmas greetings being shouted across no man's land at us. These Germans shouted out, What about you singing Holy Night? Well, we had a go, but of course we weren't very good at that. Anyway, they said, meet us and come over in no man's land. Well, after a time, we were allowed a limited number of us. Our officers allowed a limited number of us to go into... Later on in the night, there was a great deal of commotion going on in the German front line, which was about 100, 150 yards away, I suppose. And after a few moments, there were lighted objects raised above the German parapet, looking like Chinese lanterns to us. The Germans were shouting over to our trench, there's no doubt about that at all. And before we could take any action or do anything, we were ordered to open rapid fire, you see. Which we did. The Germans did not reply to our rapid fire, they simply carried on with their celebrations ignored us completely, and were having a very fine time indeed. We never did anything else but simply continue in our wet trenches trying to make the most of a bad job. I remember very well Christmas. I remember the Christmas day when the German and the French soldiers left their trenches, went to the barbed wire between them with champagne and cigarettes in their hands, and had feelings of fraternization, and shouted they wanted to finish the war. And that lasted only two days, one and a half really. And then strict order came that no fraternization was allowed and we had to stay back in our trenches. When we were on the line at Sally, Christmas 1914, there was a bit of a truce there, you know. And the Germans stopped firing, we stopped firing. And we came out of the line and they came out of the line. And we were swapping tins of bully for their tins of meat. And the Padre was out having a talk with them. They were burying any dead that was there. And we were burying any dead. This carried on for about a couple of days. Keith and Philip Ridley, two of my section, came dashing into the billet during the morning and said, What do you know? The Jerrys are out on the top. They're walking about. They're dishing out drinks and cigarettes. There's no fighting going on. Well, we'd noticed the place was very quiet. I said I don't believe it. I said, well, I can't go. I'm duty bloke for the morning, but hop off and see what you can find. So, Keith and Philip and Leslie Wood went off and they arrived back around about lunchtime. Keith with one of the Landwehr hats on. The gray thing with the red band around the button. Philip had a water bottle. They'd had drinks, they'd had smokes, and they'd been walking about. He said, you just wouldn't believe I tell you what happened on Christmas Day, 1914, and people don't believe it. We had this unofficial truce. We met in no man's land on Christmas Day, 1914. We shook hands. 
They were Saxons, and I heard one fellow talking English. I said to him, you speak English. You know what he said? Core blimey mate, he said. I was in a London hotel when the war broke out. I thought that topped it. He'd got the London accent. Sample text I talked to an officer the next day, because the truce went on for several days, and he said, you know, we could not have gone on in the first Battle of Ypres because you had so many reserves in your woods and so many automatischer pistol. I said, were your machine guns gone, all knocked out? He said, oh no, automatischer pistol. It was our 15 rounds rapid. We also learned that many of the German mass attacks were made by boys, German students of 1617, arm in arm with one rifle. We got orders come down the trench. Get back in your trenches every man, by word of mouth down each trench. Everybody back in your trenches, shouting. The generals behind must have seen it and got a bit suspicious. So what they did, they gave orders for a battery of guns behind us to fire and a machine gun to open out and officers to fire their revolvers at the Jerry's. Of course, that started the war again. Ooh, we were cursing them to hell, cursing the generals and that. You want to get up here in this stuff? Never mind your giving orders, in your big chateau and driving about in your big cars. We hated the sight of the bloody generals. Although it would be arrogant to say that the thing didn't actually take place, I very much doubt whether anything of the nature or magnitude that have been claimed for it took place at all and particularly because the two armies concerned, the German with that rigid discipline and our own with the finest discipline of a fighting force there was, are not likely to break that tradition. And if anybody tried, what were the NCOs doing? What were the officers doing? I think the whole thing borders on the fairy tale and may be classed with the Russians with snow on their boots and the angels of Mons. This runner came along when I was on this fatigue job and said, you're wanted again to interpret. I said, what is it this time? He said, there's a drunk German in our trenches and he won't go back. So I went up and saw our platoon officer there and he said, Williams, there's this chap here, he's drunk. I don't mind it's all very well to meet them in no man's land, but he's actually in our trenches. Anyway, this chap was standing there with a couple of bottles of beer wanting us to drink the health of the new year and all the rest of it. He said, tell him he's got to go back. So I told him, he wouldn't take any notice he didn't want to go back. And this officer said, well, if he stops here, he's got to be made prisoner. Ask him if he wants to be made prisoner. So I did. Oh, was. Got nine, he said. He Eventually, the officer detailed another chap and me to take him back, so he was escorted there. One on each side, and this chap staggering about and singing at the top of his voice. Well, we got up to the German wire, and I thought, well, I don't think I'll go right into their trenches. They might not be as lenient as we are. Anyway, we found a gap in the wire, headed him in the right direction, and left him to it. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to our channel, it's free, and it really emboldens us to bring you more great stories from our history.